my name is Christine Hughes, and I am a member of the Association of Corporate Counsel Northeast Chapter Board. And until recently, I was also the Vice President and General Counsel of Emerson College. We have had some fun tracking down former ACC board members, and I have one with us today, Christopher Mirabili. Um, and I will let him introduce because he is no longer on our board, and also he is no longer an in-house counsel. So maybe, Christopher, why don't you start with what you're doing now? <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to catch up, Christine. It's a wonderful excuse to hear what you've been up to and to catch up with the community uh, I so dearly loved. Um, I, uh, I started as a corporate lawyer and then took a client public and spent uh, 11 years as a general counsel in a uh, publicly traded enterprise software company that was a quirky company because it was tax resident in Ireland. Um, and uh, we had a very global business and it was a very uh, busy law department, very transactional law department. We did a lot of licensing work in addition to the, you know, the corporate compliance and uh, public company compliance. Um, and, uh, and then towards the end of my run there, I actually took over as the CFO, uh, which was a bit of an unusual transition. And when we sold the company in uh, 2008, right at, as the world was falling apart, it was an interesting, I mean, that, that's a story in and of itself. Um, I was the last CFO to ever do an M&A transaction with Lehman Brothers. Uh, we, we closed our deal on a Friday and they went bankrupt the following morning. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, uh, not better to be lucky than good. But when I popped out of that, you know, I had, I, had, um, I had been a CFO for a while. And as you become more senior as a general counsel in a, in a larger organization, you know, you're doing less day-to-day -day lawyering and, um, and more sort of business advising. And I was very fortunate that the culture at Iona um, really treated the business, the, the legal function and the general counsel as a valued part of the business. And so um, I wasn't, I had young kids and I wasn't keen to go back into um, another general counsel job. You know, the really, the really terrific ones that are a great fit are, are they're special. They don't, they don't grow on trees. And um, I decided to take that year 2009, just take the year off because it was um, just such a difficult year. And I just kind of wanted to think about what I was doing, but I really felt the siren call of uh, the early stage technology companies that I had started my corporate law practice. You know, I, I missed sort of that what's next, what's new, the fast moving younger companies where everything's possible. And so my, my year, my networking, you know, began to sort of focus on that area and I started to get quite involved with the angel investing space. And I looked around that market and I just thought there was a lot of opportunity to professionalize it. It's a very, very important function in terms of job creation and social mobility, um, national competitiveness. It's, it's, it's really vital. You know, um, all net new jobs are created by startups. And um, if startups are the engine of job creation, you know, angel investors are the fuel for that engine. And um, so uh, I, I kind of said, wow, this, this was my calling. And I um, looked around at the various organizations in the space and in the Boston area. And I said, you know, I think there's room to take a different approach. And I built a, a group um, and I had a mentor who was at a long established um, investor network who was giving me a lot of advice. And he eventually came to me and said, hey, listen, you know, I'd, I've been looking for a partner for a while. I'd love to find a way to work together. We decided to merge the groups and I took over day to day running an organization called Launchpad Venture Group, which is one of the largest and most active um, uh, angel networks in the United States. And um, we have about 150, 160 accredited investors who focus on adding both human and financial capital to helping science and technology-based um, companies in the Boston area. And it's, uh, I've done a lot of angel investing myself personally and, and overseen a tremendous number of deals in, my, in the last decade. 
um, gotten very involved in an organization with a confusingly similar <laughs> set of initials, the ACA, the Angel Capital Association was um, the, the next big nonprofit commitment I made after leaving the Northeast region of the ACC um, and gotten very involved in the public policy work. And that eventually led to an appointment at the SEC's Investor Advisory Committee, where I'm wow. the cha chair of one of the subcommittees on the Investor as Owner subcommittee. Um, and I've been doing a, a, lot, of, a lot of writing, um, a column in Inc. Magazine, which I just concluded, and um, I just finished uh, my sixth book this past summer. So really am left the law, although I do do a lot of preferred stock term sheet negotiation and drafting, uh, but for the most part, I really left the law and have focused on the innovation ecosystem for, for the last decade. Long answer to a simple question. No, it's fascinating. Um Turning to your uh, time at ACC, how did you find your way to ACC? What drew you? What made you want to be on the board? What did you distill from it? How was it helpful? Boy, at, at the Angel Capital Association, I, I, I think with such jealousy uh, about the powerful value prop that ACC represents, when you become an in-house counsel, you know, you quickly realize you're expected to know the answer to everything on every possible topic. And I, I immediately found um, the, the sort of security blanket of being an ACC member. It was one of the first things I did when I went in-house. I had read some excellent um, ACC materials and, and it was a no-brainer to, to um, do it. And I thought the events were very good. I really enjoyed the opportunity to build a peer network of other people who are going through the same thing uh, I was going through. And, um, you know, as I got uh, more and more exposure to the organization and got to know more people, I was offered, I don't remember the, it was a long run on the board, but I don't remember exactly how it came about, but I was eager uh, when invited to join uh, the board and I really viewed my chairpersonship as just a caretaker. It was my turn and I did what I could to, um, to further the, the goals and the mission of the organization because I just think it's a spectacular. I, I think the value, I think it would be worth, especially with the benefit of hindsight, I think it would be worth 10 times the dues that the ACC charges. So valuable for in-house practitioners. What advice would you give to someone, say, relatively um, new to in-house, looking to climb the ladder, um, just in terms of things you wish you knew when you started out in-house, which is, you know, there's also things we wish we knew when we started at a law firm, but uh, in-house is its own world and there, we've all learned some lessons the hard way. So if you could sort of save people a few harder lessons, what advice would you give? That's a great question. It depends a little bit on the company and the industry, but I think that um, when you're in an outside law firm, you know, you're paid to give advice and, and you're paid a lot to give advice. And it tends to have to be very, very um, carefully constructed and detailed advice based on a lot of research. When you're in-house, you're operating in a different kind of a mode. You know, there are many situations where that level of precision is required but there are more where it's not and where perfect is actually the enemy of good. Um, and so I think I would encourage uh, particularly refugees from big law firms used to that high level of deliberation and precision to do what they can to understand their client's needs and understand their role. For example, when you're a young uh, associate and you get involved in corporate contracting on the revenue side, your job is to figure out how to get the revenue in the door with a reasonable risk envelope, right? It, it, it's not an exercise in the finest drafting. It's, you know, tricks like just keeping a list of workarounds and compromises that you've done in past deals and, and just building some rapport with the other corporate counsel who probably... <laughs> isn't interested in negotiating a software deal for their corporation, you know, and, and it's, it's about understanding the goals of your client. 
and, and trying to make yourself useful in the holistic sense, as opposed to the, the no department or the, or the, the blocker department. I also think Christine that, um, working on your communication skills is so important. Figuring out how you, you can't expect the entire management team to learn your legal language. You need to learn their business language and you need to figure out how to couch your advice in ways that are concise and bottom line oriented. Dick Testa, who founded the firm that I was a corporate member of, was famous for saying he wanted to hire one-handed lawyers. And what he meant by that was he didn't want lawyers who said, on the one hand and on the other hand, you know, you just got to get to the, you got to get to the, the bottom line and give actionable, succinct advice. I remember I a former colleague of, um, actually my, my boss, um, Andrew Granger, who was at the New England Legal Foundation and went on to um, the appeals court in Massachusetts, used to say to me, I want the Gettysburg Address. Um, and I think that's much the same thing is that yeah. you, I want it succinct. I want you to pack as much into as few words as possible. And if, I've never forgotten that. I want the Gettysburg Address. That's the good. other thing, and I'm sure you've seen this in your practice and many of us in the house have, there is the art of um, getting someone to do what you want them to do and having them think it's their idea, <laughs> you know, at least having them think it's in their own interest. And uh, I can remember I had a fairly fairly difficult uh, chairman for many years at Iona. He, he had been the CFO at Sun Microsystems and he was like one of 13 kids in Ireland. And you know, he had come to the United States and made his way and he was tough as nails. And I remember sort of couching things in how it's in his interest to do them this particular way and, and, uh, and learning, to, learning to get along. So I think I think recognizing it's a different kind of practice and trying to adapt and mold yourself to the needs of your client and learn the language of your client and figure out how to be helpful to your client is the advice I would give. Absolutely. Getting in your, in your client's head um, is, uh, I think, really important. Yeah. The other thing I would say, uh, if I had advice to give, was relationships are the coin of the realm. Uh, you build a reputation for integrity, for trustworthiness, for reliability, for getting people out of tight spaces um, every day over and over. And um, to focus on the law at the risk of ignoring the relationship you're building, I think is a mistake. I think that's really smart. What, what, what you're really talking about, I think, is a lot of lawyers go through life and they, and they get graded on their IQ. They get A's and they're, they're achievers and they, they look for good grades in law review and law school. And then, you know, maybe they continue to be graded on their IQ when they're in a firm practice, but they get in house and ultimately really they're graded on their EQ. Yeah. And, and it's a very different transition. Um, just stuff. I, I remember writing a series of articles for one of the legal journals um, back in the day and I remember talking about how, you know, using your judgment and knowing when to make the dive and catch, the teaching the salesperson who was a procrastinator and always came to you with a mess um, uh, 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 and, and maybe not making the dive and catch for them, but knowing when someone came to you and they were desperate and it wasn't their fault and they'd done everything that they could to avoid this situation. And they just needed you to pull that all nighter or get the thing done or make the diving catch or, or, you know, you, you build one fan, one cheerleader at a time by using your judgment about, you know, when, when to really go above and beyond. And those kinds of EQ skills, I think are really pretty critical in house. And by EQ, you mean essentially emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. that's true. Well, Christopher, thank you so much. Um, it's good to catch up with you. Good to see you. Um, and I think many people will be well served by your advice. Loads of fun to catch up and congratulations on your recent retirement and uh, best of luck to uh, ACC and its board and all of its members. It is a truly special and wonderful organization and I miss my friends there very much. <music>